This presentation will explore the model that shamanic use of vision plants provides for transpersonal psychology, particular attention given to the role such plants play in personal integration, deeper implications of shamanic use of plants, role of mind in the natural order and the planetary future. Basically for myself, my involvement with shamanism has been a deepening meditation over now about 20 years. And it seems to me very fruitful because it continues to change and integrate itself ever more deeply into the meaning of reality at large so that uh, for me shamanism has become a kind of overarching metaphor for not only personal being in the world but the historical adventure the being of the species in the world so I want to talk about it today and and as an advocate, I want to make it seem indispensable to living a life of right reason in the world. I want to show that without shamanism, the, the notion of humanism itself is in a kind of jeopardy. And probably most of us can find ourselves in agreement with that but then I want to leave most of us behind and go further <laughs> and suggest that this humanness rooted in shamanism is a humanness ultimately rooted in very complex symbiotic relationships with plants and chemicals in the environment. Want to argue, in fact, that... Uh, People without plants are in a state of potential neurosis, a state of existential wanting, and, in, and that, in fact, part of the Western dilemma is the sense of abandonment that followed with the breaking off of these symbiotic relations with vision producing plants uh, that characterized the rise of Western monotheism and even more characterized the rise of modern society. But let me return then to the origins because this is where I think the case can be made. My interpretation of the time we're living through and this amorphous movement that we all somehow in some way are a part of which calls itself the new age or what have you I call it the archaic revival and the reason I call it the archaic revival is rooted in my conviction that it is in fact a revivifying of the models and energy forms of archaism and shamanism then is suddenly centrally highlighted. Shamanism was the profession ni plus ultra of the upper Neolithic era. And what was this profession precisely about? Well, it was about exploring the envelope of cognition, pushing against the linguistic membrane of what it was possible to say, symbolize, conceive, and communicate. Now why should one species out of all those competing on the earth attain somehow a kind of mega adaptive ability that causes a kind of compression of biological time into the phenomenon that we call history. Is it simply, as our theologians have always been forced to conceive, that 
divine agency entered into the mechanism of the world and somehow set a spark in motion that kindled and grew into humanity? Or is it, as the 19th century explored so exhaustively, the possibility that incremental change can eventually initiate uh, and insinuate into a situation new states of higher order, including even possibly the state of higher order that we call self-reflecting consciousness. But somehow this is no more than a gradual refinement out of previous states of nature. Well, what I want to suggest is that it is a bit of both of these points of view the divine intervention and the evolutionary. I think what evolutionary biologists have missed in looking at the emergence of human beings out of the primate phylogeny is, generally speaking, the mutagenic influence of foods. The fact that a fruit-eating arboreal primate, because of a situation of spreading dryness in the environment evolved into a pack hunting creature of the grasslands with an omnivorous diet. And omnivores, by their very nature, expose themselves to a very large number of mutagenic influences. I'm speaking now chemically mutagenic influences that interfere with uh, correct copying of protein, interfere with uh, spacing of children, lactation, uh, interfere with mentation, psychoactive compounds in the food chain. And it's very interesting that as human beings transform themselves into omnivorous pack hunting omnivores, you begin to see the first faint stirrings of self-reflection. You begin to get the fire pits and later the, ch the chipped flint leavings of earliest Neolithic human tool making. What this says to me is that there was a unique confluence of factors present in the evolutionary situation that were capable of kindling this ontological transformation of what had previously been the animal mind. And what I suggest this factor is, or was, psychoactive plants in the environment, specifically psychoactive plants in the grasslands environment in which human pastoralism evolved in Africa over a million years ago. The plant must be African. It must be extraordinarily noticeable in the environment. It must not be a deep forest endemic because this is not where human evolution was taking place. The only plant which fits this uh, description is uh, a mushroom of the psilocybin containing variety. And it's very easy to see, I think, that the presence then of uh, psychoactive compounds of this sort in the early human diet set the stage for a number of structural and psychological changes. Psilocybin ingested in low doses increases visual acuity. Now, it's not difficult to see that in an animal in under evolutionary pressure in a pack hunting environment, increased visual acuity will mean a more successful reproductive strategy. This means that those animals not including the psychoactive substance in their diet will be mitigated against and fade from the scene. And by this process, a steady bootstrapping process Self-reflection was born in our species. How do we get from visual acuity to self-reflection? Low dose 